This is the James Donkey RS2 3.0 and it's an absolute peach of a keyboard for the very modest price tag and we'll go in depth into the features and typing experience in this video. Thanks to Met Keys for sending the James Donkey RS2 3.0 for a review. Check out the description below where you'll find discount codes and links for both the bare bone and fully assembled keyboard. You can also use discount code KEEPFACE5 site wide on Met Keys for 5% off. So when Metkeys reached out to review this one, I felt a bit of dread to be honest. I reviewed the James Donkey A3 previously, really didn't like it, and got a bunch of flack in the comments for giving my honest opinion in the review. I can't tell you how relieved I am that the RS2 3.0 is so much better, as I really wasn't looking forward to piling on them again. The James Donkey RS2 3.0 is the third iteration of the RS2, which is the 99 key compact full layout keyboard from their lineup. The RS2 1.0 had most of the main features including the 99 key layout, a gasket mount and the tri-mode connect. By the looks of it, the RS2 2.0 upgrade was a change in colorway to this very nice black, orange and grey, a change in keycap profile from double shot PBT OEM to double shot PBT CSA and the swap from white backlight on the 1.0 to full RGB on the 2.0. Moving on to the 3.0, obviously the most notable upgrade is the addition of the multifunction display screen, but it's also the first version with a south facing PCB to allow for the use of cherry profile keycaps. The RS2 3.0 is priced on Metkeys at $116 fully assembled and just $86 as a kit. You really are getting great value for money. It's the super useful compact full layout with an encoder knob, it's gasket mounted, it has tri mode connectivity with a 4000 milliamp hour battery powering wireless mode, it has case and plate dampening and a switch mat, it has height adjusting feet, full RGB, and the fully assembled version comes with either Gateron G Pro Silvers or Kale Box V2 Reds. The icing on the cake is obviously the super useful screen controlled using the encoder knob. Now let's get it out of the box. Removing the top of the box reveals the fully assembled keyboard with a plastic dust cover. You also get an Allen key for case disassembly, a keycap puller, a switch puller, the quick start guide and manual, and a USB cable with the USB-C keyboard end with a 90 degree angle for a nice clean desk setup. Let's get the stock sound test done before moving on to first impressions. Well, holy shimoli, that was a good stock typing test. In all honesty, while there are incremental gains and sound profile changes that you could make with some mods, this keyboard has no significant setbacks in terms of the typing sound or feel, which need addressing with any urgency. I would happily use this one stock. The typing sound is just really clean, poppy, and not too loud without sounding thin or muted. I don't think I've tested a keyboard which would be more perfect for just unboxing and popping on your desk if you work in an open plan office or cubicle. Looking around the keyboard it has a really nice design, if I'm honest I'm not mad on the white and light blue colourway, but the design is good with the blue bottom and the white top case, with the cutouts in the sides of the top case revealing the bottom case as kind of an accent. The keycaps obviously match up really nicely. We have the height adjusting feet on the bottom giving three typing angle options, and the 2.4GHz receiver is nicely secured into the bottom case using both a magnet and clipping into place. Wireless mode works perfectly, you just hit the button on the back to switch the keyboard and screen on, the power button is a really nice change to a sliding switch and I actually prefer it. In Bluetooth mode you can connect to up to three devices, you press and hold function 1, 2 or 3, placing the keyboard in pairing mode as indicated on the screen. For 2.4GHz mode you press function plus 4. Looking at the screen itself, this is my first keyboard with a screen and I have to say I absolutely love it. On the home screen you get the time, date and battery level, as well as indicators for OS mode, caps lock, num lock and the method of connectivity you are using. It's super useful just having the battery level on display at all times, but there is much more that you can do with this. By pressing function plus the encoder knob, you switch the knob from volume and mute to controlling the screen and keyboard settings. You can then use the knob and screen to control the RGB effect, colour, brightness and effect speed. You can also adjust the system volume within this screen, you can change the screen language between Chinese and English, you can change the operating system 
between Windows and Mac, and you can add a picture if you've set some up in the app. Speaking of the software, the James Donkey RS2 3.0 driver seems very in-depth. It looks like you can change the layout, add macros, change the RGB, and you can upload pictures for the screen to use as kind of a screensaver. There may be more you can do with the screen, I'm still figuring it out. I absolutely love the screen, and I can't quite believe the functionality and integration for the price. Now let's get the keyboard apart and see if there's anything we can do in terms of obvious improvements, but only really to show you guys what the crack is, not because I particularly feel the need to address any problems. First off, we're going to remove just a few keycaps, switches, and the spacebar stabilizer for a closer inspection. On closer inspection, I can see that the keycaps are a reasonably nice set for what I expect to be a very inexpensive set of keycaps. I can't find them sold separately, but if they are a James Donkey set, they will retail at around $30 to $40. Their OEM profile are 1.5 millimeters thick, so the same thickness as GMK keycaps, and while the legends aren't perfect, they're pretty good considering the price of the board. The Gatoron G Pro Silvers are actually pretty nice and have a small amount of factory lube applied to the stems. There is no spring ping, the sound is nice, and they really suit the keyboard as they are, so I'm not planning to hand lube or film them. The stabilizers only have a small amount of factory lube on them and there's no rattle so they must be really nicely made. Taking them apart I can see that the stems need clipping but I didn't really notice there being any mushiness on the bottom out. There is no lube on the stem or in the housing as is almost always the case with factory lube stabilizers. Moving on to disassembly, the 3.0 is the first RS2 in the lineup to have case screws with the predecessors being clipped together. This is a significant improvement for me so we just remove the encoder knob, remove the case screws and lift off the top case. From here we just flip up the plate and PCB assembly to reveal two wires which need to be disconnected, the display screen and encoder wire top right, and the door to board wire in the center. With those disconnected, we can lift out the plate and PCB. This is as far as I'm going to disassemble the keyboard as I'm not going to be hand lubing the switches or removing any dampening from the plate and PCB assembly. Taking a closer look at things, the top case is nice quality and with the encoder and screen top right with this little logo in between. I'm not sure what the logo is as the lettering doesn't look to be a J or a D. I really like the way they've put the encoder and screen on its own little daughter board instead of integrating them into the PCB. It makes disassembly super simple with just the wire to remove from the PCB. In the bottom case, we have a really nice silicone dampening pad that is perfectly made for every nook and cranny in the bottom case. Removing it, while unnecessary, does require the removal of the daughter board as it pinches down on the pad a little. Underneath the dampening, we have the 4000 mAh battery hidden away and the daughter board with the USB-C port and power button is really easy to remove but all looks really clean both inside and out. You can see the bottom gaskets in the bottom case, they are incredibly soft, bordering on feeling too soft in the hand, but they make for a really nice and plush gasket. I thought I had one gasket missing, but there is no gasket in the top right where the plate and PCB is cut out for the screen and encoder. The PCB is really nice and much to my surprise we have screw-in stabilizer compatibility. There are no flex cuts in the PCB which I like to see, as it's not needed with this gasket system and would make the keyboard sound thinner. We can see the plate dampening pad between the plate and PCB which will stay where it is in this keyboard, and likewise we have a switch mat which will also stay where it is. In my experience, all the dampening improves the sound on plastic chassis keyboards. The plate is actually FR4 which is one of my favourite plate materials and I think this will be helping no end with that lovely poppy sound profile. Finally we have the encoder knob which is kind of a thin and wide deal with a plastic centre and a metal surround. Now in terms of mods there is really nothing to be done with any urgency but I will do some work on the stabilisers and I will tape mod just for a sound comparison. So first up I tape modded with three layers of masking tape. Three layers is my go to tape mod as it creates a pretty thick sheet for maximum effect. You certainly don't gain anything by doing more layers than this, but you may want to use less layers for a more subtle change. Don't forget to cut out around the two JST ports for plugging in the daughter boards. After the tape mod, we can just reassemble the keyboard. The stabilizers are plate mount, so it can be modded and installed after assembly, or obviously without disassembly if you don't want to take the keyboard apart. So to reassemble, we plug back in the two daughter boards, land the plate and PCB in the case, pop on the top case, and reinstall the case screws. Next, I gave the stabs the usual treatment, I just clipped the stems, lubed the outside of the stems and inside of the housings with Crytox 205 grade 0, and lubed the wires with dielectric grease. The FR4 plate is cut a little tight to the stabs, so take your time reinstalling these to avoid bending the wires. With the stabs back in, we can pop in the switches and install the keycaps, and we're ready for a modded typing test.
So as you will have heard there, we did manage to clean up the stabilizers a bit with the clipping and lube job, even though they were really good stock. And we also created that tapey tone with the tape mod. Again, this doesn't give the same gain as it does on some keyboards, but it may be worth doing if you like the change to the sound profile. So let's quickly summarize with my thoughts on this one, and I have to say, it's probably the best value for money stock out of the box, no mods needed, plonk it on your desk and away you go keyboards I've ever tested. It has such a nice sound profile for a plastic chassis keyboard, and the typing feel is really satisfying. With this layout, the screen, the encoder knob, and the tri-mode connect, it really is the perfect productivity daily driver keyboard for at home or in the office. The only thing I would change is I would make some more colorway options available. Light blue and white is a very distinctive colorway, and if going with a single colorway as they have with this one, perhaps something more neutral like gray and white would have been better. This keyboard in the RS2 2.0 colorway would have been an absolute home run for me, but this is all preference related stuff. All in all, this is an excellent keyboard keyboard and I highly recommend it for the money in the productivity use case. I hope you found this useful, don't forget to use my affiliate links and codes in the description for some discount and I'll catch you in the next one.